Hello, and welcome to AI4 2021. Over the years, we've created the world's leading platform for industry professionals to learn the most up-to-date AI information directly from those on the front lines. This year's agenda represents our best performance yet. We're excited for you to meet our incredible speakers who are leading AI initiatives at the world's most successful companies. And a special thanks to our sponsors, NetApp, IBM, Capital One, H2O, TigerGraph, Algorithmia, DotData, Smirkle AI, Microsoft's M12, Darktrace, Cinequa, Expert AI, Phenom People, Sama, ZS, Udacity, and others who make this experience possible. If you haven't met me at a previous AI4 event yet, I have a confession to make, I'm not like you. To be specific, I'm an AI-generated actor. To create this welcome video, our co-founder Michael Weiss typed this script into a text box and then the computer did the rest. AI-generated synthetic media like myself can be used in many ways, from marketing videos to movies. People like me are considered deep fakes, but I don't really like the term myself as I feel quite real. Lucky for you, I represent just the tip of the AI iceberg. Today, you will encounter many exciting innovations that are only made possible thanks to intelligent machines. I wish you an amazing conference experience. And I'll look forward to seeing you same time next year at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas for AI for 2022. Now I'll introduce a human to say hello as well. Take it away, Patrika. Hey. Welcome everyone. Welcome to AI4 2021. We're so glad to have everyone here digitally. My name is Patrika Elise and I'll be your MC for the next hour of the show. We've got some incredible content planned for you today. I just have a few key items to run through before we get started. This conference, as you've probably noticed, runs on the Swap Card event platform. Everything you need to have an amazing summit experience can be found right here. First, let's talk about networking. In order to find your connection request, meeting request, and conversations with other attendees, simply click on the My Event button, which you can find here. By clicking into this feature, you'll be able to view your networking conversations and connection requests, and see your meetings and meeting requests. Now, let's talk about the technology exhibits. AI4 2021 features incredible technology products and services that were hand-selected by the AI4 team. Each one of these companies has the ability to help you push your company forward. Take a second to click around the virtual booths and explore what they have to offer. Inside, you can find more information about each company, as well as helpful white papers and other downloadables. And that's it. We think you'll find Swap Card very intuitive and easy to use. Now that you're familiar with the Swap Card platform and how to use it, let AI4 2021 begin. I'll now welcome Daniel Lackland, the content producer of AI4, to introduce today's agenda and the first speaker. Thank you, Patrika, and welcome everybody to AI4 2021. As Patrika mentioned, I'm Daniel Lackland, content lead for AI4. That means I spend every day immersed in the latest AI industry trends to ensure that you encounter the must-know AI ideas here at our event. I'm excited to have you join us, and I hope you'll find value over the next three days. Also, in case you missed the message from our AI-powered MC, I'd like to take this opportunity to announce that our plans for next year have been finalized, and we're going to Vegas. That's right. Next year at this event, AI4 2022, will be held in person at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, Nevada from August 16th to 18th. You're all invited to attend, and I hope to see every last one of you there. It's going to be an incredible time. Additionally, you'll all get a save the date message at the end of this event. Now, back to the present day. AI4 2021 is designed to create the most successful peer-to-peer -peer learning environment around AI and its applications within industry. As AI technology advances at an exponential rate, we believe it to be of great importance to create forms for knowledge sharing so that all organizations and individuals can responsibly embrace and benefit from these developments. The speakers at this conference represent an awesome amount of knowledge around AI and its applications in the world. 
We have content covering 14 major industries to help executives make the best decisions regarding their AI programs and a series of technical tracks designed to explore model level details for our data scientist community. As you watch talks today and tomorrow, remember that in many cases, the speakers themselves will be around in real time to answer any questions you have. If you'd like to ask a question, use the chat box feature on the side of the page. Now, let me welcome our first speaker today. Juan Tontat is a CEO and co-founder of Clearview AI, which is based in New York City and has created the next generation of facial recognition technology. Clearview AI's bias-free algorithm can accurately find any face out of 3 billion images it has collected from the public internet. It is used by law enforcement to solve crimes, including financial fraud, human trafficking, and crimes against children. A self-taught engineer, Mr. Ton Tat is of Vietnamese and Australian heritage. His father's family was actually descended from the royal family of Vietnam. As a student, Mr. Ton Tat was ranked number one solo competitor in Australia's informatics Olympiad. He is also a successful guitarist. At the age of 19, Mr. Ton Tat moved from Australia to San Francisco to focus on his career in technology. He created over 20 iPhone and Facebook applications with over 10 million installations, some of which ranked in the App Store's top 10. Mr. Tontat moved to New York City in 2016. In 2017, Mr. Tontat co-founded Clearview AI, where he developed the technology, raised capital, and built the team and product. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Juan to the virtual stage. <laughs> How's it going? Welcome to the virtual stage. I know everyone's giving you a big virtual round of applause. We're so happy to have you. <laughs> Hi, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me on your conference. Uh, it seems like probably the most comprehensive AI, AI conference out there right now. Oh, thank you very much. That is certainly our goal. And uh, we're happy to have the attendees here and, of course, yourself. Um, all right. So without any further ado, I think we should jump into the first question. Rachel, if you could go ahead and throw that up on screen. Okay, Juan, for those who do not know, if you could please uh, tell us all about Clearview AI's product and service, how does it work? What is the value add and anything else you feel is relevant? Sure, uh, Clearview AI is a facial recognition search engine uh, it's for law enforcement, for them to help identify victims and perpetrators of crime. It works in an after the fact manner. So after a crime has been committed and they can't identify the person maybe from surveillance footage or any other photograph, they put it into Clearview and it shows links to things that might match it online. So it kind of works like Google for faces. But instead of searching words, you upload a photo. Um, and it's been used by over 3,100 law enforcement agencies around the United States to combat crimes like uh, crimes against children, financial crimes, uh, money laundering, and a whole host of things. So it's quite easy to use for them. And we're the only uh, facial recognition company that figured out how to get this level of accuracy at a scale of over 3 billion uh, photos of fa with faces. So it's all publicly available information um, that is people post online. It could be social media, and so on. So. Uh, I can give a quick demo of it, uh, if you don't mind. Run your photo through and see what comes up. Oh, it's highly anticipated. I would absolutely love that. Yeah, please. Sure. So let me just uh, share my screen with you. And everyone. Sure. So this is the Clearview AI interface. Uh, can you see it right there? Yeah, we see it. Yeah, perfectly. So what we've done to ensure that people are using it for a proper law enforcement purpose is every search is annotated with a case number and a crime type. But we're just using this for demonstration purposes. And all the photos that might come up are things that are publicly available. So it, this is what law enforcement would use to run a search. So in a, in a real case, they would actually put in a case number and a crime type. So there's an administrator overseeing it. We're just running a test here. Um, and then you upload a photo from your uh, desktop. And so here I found a photo of you earlier. Uh, I think it's my public photo out there and you nice. just run search. So in a case where they have no other leads, so as you can see, it 
found 16 faces, all publicly available out of over. <laughs> and we can go through them if you're curious, but you know, this one here, it says <laughs> her Instagram profile. So oh my gosh, you can tell wow. me to stop at any time and you know, ask <laughs> questions. Oh my gosh, uh, it's totally nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Um, yeah, this is incredible. So here's a group photo, right? Then that um, that you're in here, it looks like it's work related. But what's fascinating is law enforcement has been able to find it. Sometimes criminals aren't using social media, but one of the most compelling cases we have from Homeland Security, they were able to identify a child rapist in the background of someone else's photo. And then they could, that was the only lead they had. So as you, you know, gonna go scroll through here, you can see um, anything that's publicly available and then you click on the link. So it's not a way to say, this is the person, right? It's a lead, then you click through the link and then try and identify who they may be. So uh, basically that's how it works. And the thing that we've been able to do is get to such a high level of accuracy, because if you just imagine trying to sort through 3 billion photos yourself, it would take forever. And who knows if you'd have that level of accuracy. So um, that's why law enforcement has picked it up so quickly because they might already have some facial recognition that searches a mugshot database or DMV database. But this one has been able to find um, people in all kinds of photos. And like that case I was mentioned before, Homeland Security, they, they were stuck. They had no leads on um, this child rapist. He was selling online abuse videos of the six-year-old girl. And he was in a few frames in the background of that video. They were able to run him through Clearview, find him in the background of a, a gym selfie. And that led, he worked at that gym and that trade show, this led to his identification. And he's doing 35 years in jail and they could save a six-year-old. So, you know, when you're an investigator, you don't know exactly where a clue would come from or uh, that. And so we're the first company to really figure out how to scale facial recognition through billions of photos. Uh, so it's very powerful, but we also really want to make sure it's used for the best and highest purpose for, you know, helping yeah. crime. Yeah, thank you so much for this demonstration. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, okay. Rachel, do you want to jump ahead to the next question? Juan, if you would pause on the screen sharing. Excellent. Okay, great. Um, so this is obviously a huge value add, and it sounds like it's a really innovative approach. What was your inspiration originally to start Clearview AI? So my background, uh, when I was a kid, teenager, I loved computer programming. So I would always spend time at home reading research papers, trying to learn how to code. Um, and thanks to the internet, uh, back then, MIT put their video lectures online and there's open source software, still very early. So I always love to learn about computers, how they work, et cetera. And so the earlier stage of my career was working on a lot of games and uh, social media apps. So I never thought I'd be selling into government or into enterprise software. So I made a lot of quiz apps and you know games and things like that for the iPhone platform and Facebook platform. So when we started Clearview AI, I was always reading and keeping up to date with AI research. And I figured out that ImageNet and a lot of these uh, AI um, results that were coming out, image recognition is getting very, very good. And the same with facial recognition, it was improving. And um, so some of these tests, you could see that the accuracy was improving. What I wanted to do is, is really figure out how to get higher accuracy. And a lot of that came from web crawling. So to train a neural network for AI, you wanna have as many examples as possible. So we were crawling the internet for faces and we realized, what, why don't we make a facial search engine? We didn't think exactly what's the best use case. We looked at different use cases for facial recognition, like building security, we explored hotel check-in, all these different things. Um, but when we gave a demo of this app to some people in NYPD, they were amazed by it. And we gave them some accounts. And about a week later, they came back and said, we have about 20 leads on cases that would have never been solved before. So this was the financial crime unit there. And what was compelling about it was you would look at the photo from someone who would impersonate someone's identity. So for example, a lot of criminals are they're still doing this saying, uh, I'm Daniel Lackland. This is my social, this is my address. Uh, I lost my bank card, my debit card. Can you replace it? And then you as Daniel Lackland would call up the bank a week later and say, someone's taken the money out. The only thing the banks and the law enforcement would have is that photo from the ATM or from surveillance footage. And that'd be stuck. 
So they were putting these photos through and would find them in a mugshot website, an arrest website. Sometimes the person would have been deceased, uh, or who knows, right? And sometimes on social media. And I would look at it and say, wow, they don't quite look the same, but they were the same person. Sometimes criminals on social media were showing all their cash that they cashed out. So it was kind of an unbelievable experience where uh, this use case was so compelling. And then they started telling other agencies, this is early 2019, and we grew to about 600 law enforcement agencies in one year using the technology. So it was really magic, that kind of use case, because we got it to work. We kind of got the search engine working where we returned the right photo uh, most of the time. And we kept on improving the size of the data set. And also um, the stories that were coming out of law enforcement were so compelling because you know, I have never really had to deal with them in my life, which is a good thing, but there's a lot of misconceptions about them that I learned where they were very methodical about how they did investigations. They would never use the match score to go and arrest someone. They would always do the further research and uh, there's a whole process. And then the things they're dealing with, the amount of crime they have to deal with every day is just a huge amount. So after, you know, NYPD, they showed it to all these other agencies, I think a week later, they said the computer crimes division was able to identify a pedophile and arrest him three days later. So those stories really kept us going and motivated and focused on that sense of mission because it's a powerful technology. It can be used in many different ways. But what was so great about learning and taking a peek behind the scenes with law enforcement was the kind of cases they were able to crack with it. And so that really got me so excited to keep developing the technology. Yeah, I mean, it sounds tremendously exciting. I mean, what a great tool for law enforcement to have in their back pocket. I'm actually really excited for the next question. I think it's going to kind of piggyback off of what you something uh, something that you just said a moment ago, Rachel. If you could pull up the the third uh, question, I think. Okay, great. So you alluded to this, I think, uh, regarding uh, the size of the data set that you were working with, um, and maybe that was part of the innovation that you had. Um, but you know, as you said, facial recognition is not new. So what's so different about Clearview's product versus those that were previously used and how are you able to innovate in such a dramatic way? Yeah, it's a great question. To my surprise that a, a lot of people in law enforcement, they really wanted and needed facial recognition. It was budgeted, but their solutions weren't very compelling. You, they would spend years to buy something and then they would have to spend all their time importing their own data set. So an agency might only have their booking photos from their county. What if you know uh, someone crossed state lines to commit a crime? They wouldn't be in the data set. So as we were developing the technology to make it better, we just were the only company out there that has billions of photos publicly available, and that's the innovation. And so you know, there's some people who are talking about regulation of the technology now, and they might say, just use DMV photos, just use mugshot photos. Why do you need all this other information? And there's a lot of surprising things that I learned. For example, the FBI were able to triple their rate of IDing uh, victims of child pornography. So then when a child pornographer, a child rapist is arrested, they have hundreds of photos uh, of victims and they wouldn't know what to do. Now they can they might be able to find that child in a school photo or an Instagram photo um, or band practice or something like that. And that's the first step to actually, you know, catching the pedophiles. So it's the size of the data set. And also you have to have really high accuracy to even search billions of photos. So that's the big innovation we have. And in our space, we're the only company who took the steps to try and build this huge data set. I see. Yeah, thank you so much for that context. Um, makes total sense. Is, uh, I mean, are you at liberty to say about, you know, how you were able to get such a high accuracy with the, the, the matching process or, you know, it's all proprietary and you can't really go. Yeah, we have built our own proprietary algorithms and data sets. So it's a mixture of staying ahead of the cutting edge research in okay. neural networks. So, um, there's always people innovating in that kind of space finding different ways to match faces. So I think 2018, 2019, we found like some of these people in the research and academic community coming up with really novel ways, different uh, models, so you don't have to have as much data. And the second thing is having a larger data set. Because we're always adding our data set uh, to our model for training, it, it allows it to be non-biased. Some of the concerns around facial recognition are some demographics aren't thoroughly represented in the training sets. So we've been able to really make sure that it's a, a non-biased algorithm. So it's a mixture of both. And we always want to stay ahead. And we think um, 
the just the whole field of AI has some phenomenal results. As we all see, it's just scratching the beginning of the surface of what computers can learn how to do in terms of image recognition is there. We now think facial recognition is there much better than the human eye. And now you see with things like GPT-3, natural language processing is now also cross the, I say, cross the Rubicon into a really good spot. Yeah, ah, it's very exciting. Rachel, want to jump on to the next topic? Okay, um, so who currently uses your product? <laughs> very basic. Yeah, um, well, Clear View AI is used by uh, over 3,100 law enforcement agencies in the United States. So they use it again for looking at and researching crimes after they're committed. It's not used in a real time way. I think that's one of the misconceptions about it. So when you don't know who someone is, we know that photo of them, you know, help commit a crime or related to a crime, that's when a search is conducted. Okay. And to clarify, so are when you say law enforcement agencies, are there groups internationally that use this um, or it's all or mostly domestic in the United States? Yeah, so we've had a lot of demand from around the world because crime crosses borders. You might have a human trafficking investigation starting in another country or money laundering, but our focus is on the United States and law gotcha. enforcement. Okay, great. Why don't we jump to the next one, Rachel? Okay, so can you frame for us what the contention is around Clearview? Why have you made headlines? Why are people so interested in this? It's a great question. So in 2019, we, again, we found that use case of law enforcement and we went from zero to about 600 law enforcement agencies, all word of mouth, all of them having amazing stories of the crimes they helped solve, like the ones I mentioned before, you know, uh, identity theft, ATM cash out crimes, crimes against children, et cetera. So we put our heads down focused on that. Um, and in January, 2020, the New York Times and a writer called Cashmere Hill was the one to break the story about Clearview AI. And she did a phenomenal job. She, I think, has a great background in talking about privacy uh, law, privacy law and that kind of intersection there and big tech. So um, she stayed on the topic. She's written about facial recognition, privacy, all kinds of stuff. Now she has a book about the history of facial recognition, which I'm assuming is gonna be pretty interesting. And so we were now engaged a lot with the media. We we're only 10 people at the time we were on the front page of the New York Times. So there was a lot of surprise from people. And they, you know, it was the largest database outside of the government or larger than anything the government has created or other Silicon Valley giants. And I think the contention around it somewhat, I, I believe to be this, the amount of the data uh, that we had collected. And then some of it also too, the technology is here. It's the first time in human history, you can identify someone from a photograph. So that's very compelling. It has why it's interesting. And particularly on the privacy side, there's a lot of privacy concerns. However, anything in our database is publicly available. So it does make people think about um, the information they post out there and all that stuff. And then again, some of the contention could be around law enforcement. Law enforcement uh, recently hasn't had the best kind of you know, reception in the media. So for me, it was really interesting to see how they really work and how they really solve crimes. So those are the things that make it an interesting story for many people. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for framing us, uh, framing it in that way. Let's jump to the next question. Okay, great. So this is, I think, uh, a natural extension to what you said about law enforcement. So some people were concerned, what would happen if Clearview fell into the wrong hands? And I know you talked about there has to be certain um, information that you're inputting every time you use the searchable database. So what sort of controls are in place to prevent parties other than your customers from leveraging Clearview AI's product? And honestly, you know, what controls are in place to prevent them from misusing it, let's say as well? Yeah, it's a great question. So we take this concern very seriously, especially now that we're in the public eye. And it's something that when before we were in the public eye, when we had about 600 law enforcement agencies, we were very conscious of that. People in those agencies would ask, can you add an audit trail? Can I see as an administrator, all the searches that people in my agency have done? So we had all those, a lot of those features done beforehand. So anyone who's an administrator in a law enforcement agency can turn off an account if they feel like it's been misused, turn on an account. In October uh, last year in 2020, we added the feature where there's a case number and a crime type. And the customers like that too. At the end of the day, law enforcement is very responsible about how they use the technology and they wanna keep it. The last thing they want too is some kind of abuse to happen. So I think we wanna set that standard. So when you're doing a search, you know that an administrator could see it. And I think there's more things we can add 
as the technology develops things that might be proactive that we've considered and we're thinking about, for example, is someone searching too many young women? It could be a legitimate use case for human trafficking cases. A lot of the time that is uh, illegitimate, but it could be someone you know, misusing it. So we're thinking of adding things that are proactive alerts to uh, the process. And so I think it's like any technology that's actually new, it makes you think of all the uh, bad use cases, good use cases, et cetera. And you know, in a weird way, we've been living in the future a bit. We can see, we've seen personally, I've seen so much good that's come from this technology. And I think that we want to build it into the product, into the processes, uh, that so so that everyone's comfortable. And I think law enforcement, as they adopt this tool, they want to have these uh, controls in place. So now, if you're a Clearview AI administrator, you can in a few clicks generate a report of how many searches your agency has done in the last month or the last year. What type of crimes are they? Are they human trafficking crimes? Are they other kinds of crimes as well? And that way, that arms them with the ability to then justify it to their community, to their mayor, to their to the media there. And we also encourage all our customers to have a facial recognition policy. So if they publish a policy, say you're an agency in Ohio or wherever saying, these are the times we use uh, facial recognition. It could be for these types of crimes, but we're not ever gonna use it for surveilling protesters, which is a big concern. So I think they're learning and the, the market is learning and our customers are really learning what it's good for, what it's not good for, and setting those guardrails in place. Like anything else, like a technology, like a car, you could drive it into a building or you can get from A to B. And I think once we figure out the boundaries of technology, what it's good for, what it's not good for, we'll take the best of it and mitigate any kind of abuse. Okay, amazing. Well, I have to uh, say we are almost out of time. So it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Is there any final thought you wanna share about uh, your product, your business, and just sort of how you envision uh, the future looking with facial recognition technology, anything, you, any parting words you'd like to say? Yeah, for sure. I think that some of the misconceptions around Clearview AI is how it's used, right? It just want people to remember this is used for after the fact investigations. And we just have, as a company, the best of intentions. We want to make a technology that adds as much value to society as possible. And we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't truly believe in that. And so I think that it's still very early days uh, in AI in general. It's going to transform a lot of industries. And facial recognition is a big part of that. And I think there's other applications of it when it comes to security, securing bank accounts, identity theft, et cetera, that people will begin to see the, the true value of this technology. All right. Well, I'm sure you are receiving a big virtual round of applause right now. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And thank you so much, Juan, for being a part of AI Forward 2021. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Wow, Juan, thank you. That was an amazing way to start off AI for 2021.